Well, as you can see, we're in Revelation chapter 9 tonight, and we'll try to also finish chapter 10. Revelation chapter 9. Just a, uh, a brief review of the last couple or so chapters. We saw um, the seven seals being opened. And that started back in chapter 6. And you can flip back there with me and let's just do a 30,000 foot overview of, of uh, where we've been so far recently. The Lamb, who is Jesus, he's opening the seven seals. And what were the first four seals? Do you remember? Yeah, the four horsemen, the four horses and their riders. And we saw the horses were... Uh, conquest, war, famine, and death. And then we open the fifth seal in chapter 6. And this, I believe, is very important uh, to what's to follow in the book. Uh, when the Lamb broke the fifth seal, I'm in verse 9, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? This is an important question because it, it gives us an indication of how things are going to unfold. God is going to deal with the wicked people who have put these saints to death and shed their blood. But as we read here in chapter 6, it wasn't quite time. There were going to be more saints who would lose their lives. And this, of course, reminds us of the purpose of this book. It was to reveal to the bondservants of Jesus the things which must soon take place. And things were going to get hard for the saints, as we've seen. The uh, sixth seal, what was that? The end of chapter 6. What was the sixth? Sixth seal. Yeah, earthquake. The sun, moon, and stars uh, were affected. Um, they, the stars fall to the earth. The moon becomes like blood. The sun becomes dark. And what does this indicate? At least as we look at the Old Testament and how the Old Testament uses this very same kind of language over and over again. What might this indicate here? You remember? Judgment, right? Judgment on a nation. God used this kind of language to talk about judgment on Babylon in Isaiah. Uh, he uses this kind of language to talk about judgment on Edom. And, and this is Old Testament style of, of the prophets. It's apocalyptic language, you might call it. It's figurative, symbolic, spiritual language to show that God is working amongst the nations and God is judging among the nations. And um, we had a little break in the action then in chapter 7 where we see the, the um, sealing of the 144,000. These are the faithful ones, God's people, and they're not going to be judged along with the wicked. They may suffer some of these things because they live on this earth, but they're not going to be judged like the wicked are going to be judged. Um, and we get, I think, kind of a flash forward here at the end of chapter 7, the last half of chapter 7 of this multitude of God's people who are surrounding God and praising God. And he wipes away every tear from their eye. It's a beautiful image. But then, uh, what happens when the seventh seal is opened? Okay, we had the interlude. It's like a pause, a silence for a short time, right? What does he say? 30 minutes, a half an hour in heaven? Symbolic. You know, there's this calm before the storm, right? And then what happens when the seventh seal is opened? 
Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, these, these are all correct. And, and when the seventh seal is opened, we get a series of what? Seven trumpets. And so now we're in the trumpets. We started that last week. What was a trumpet for in biblical times? Battle, warning of something coming. It was used to call people together, but I think what you have here is warning that God is uh, hes about to start answering the question of the martyred saints. How long, O Lord? And he's, he's moving to bring judgment. And uh, so that's where we are. We looked at the uh, first four trumpets last week in chapter 8. We saw a third of the earth, the trees and the grass burned up. We saw a third of the sea became blood. A third of the sea creatures died. A third of the ships on the sea were destroyed. We saw the waters become wormwood. Wormwood, remember, is, is poison in a high enough amount. And a third of the heavenly bodies, again, were affected in these trumpets. And this is, this is um, very serious. This is it's kind of uh, heart-stopping material. I mean, this is very frightening to see God in action like this. It's very, I don't know what the right word is. It's, it's sobering. It's, yeah, it's unsettling, but it's, it's awesome. You know, it's terrifying. It's, it's all of these things to see the power of God on display, but he's doing it on behalf of the saints. He's helping his people. Uh, and then at the end of chapter 8, we saw last week, verse 13, Then I looked and I heard an eagle flying in mid-heaven saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth, because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. What does that tell you? Things are going to get worse. Woe is not a good thing, is it? There's more coming, more terrifying judgment coming. But remember, the, the saints of God have been sealed with God's name on their forehead. So God knows them. God is protecting them. In the end, they will be victorious, even if they have to deal with some hardships. But the question is asked, who can stand? Woe to those who dwell on the earth. The remaining trumpets are about to sound. And, uh, well, this was actually earlier when he said, who can stand? But remember, the, the, uh, the children of God are marked. They'll be able to stand. So we have trumpets five through seven still to go, and that's where we'll begin tonight in chapter 9. Let's read verses 1 through 3 of chapter 9. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven which had fallen to the earth. And the key of the bottomless pit was given to him. He opened the bottomless pit, and smoke went up out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke came locusts upon the earth, and power was given them as the scorpions of the earth have power. Frightening image, isn't it? Remember, this, this apocalyptic language, he's painting a picture for us. And I want to just remind us of that. We could get very um, kind of hyper-focused on every detail of this vision. And I, I don't really think that's what we're intended to do with Revelation. He's painting this picture to show us what's about to happen. We, we shouldn't really focus on every little brush stroke, perhaps. But we should get the picture, get the image of what God is trying to get across. Linda, do you have a thought?
That's right. It's, it's going to be answered. God is beginning in his time to answer this, this plea for justice and for vengeance uh, upon those who had shed their blood. So, this is a frightening image. What, what do you see here? Just walk me through it, verses 1 through 3. What did John see? Yeah, yeah, uh, the star from heaven. It says the key was given to this star. Well, what does that mean? What, how does that work? Well, hold on a second. He's, we'll get more insight on that later in chapter 9. But yeah, Don is right. He, he has this key of the, uh, the abyss or the, the bottomless pit, my version has. It's the shaft of the abyss. Does the abyss, does that language and the sight that you're seeing here, does that make you think that this is something good? No, <laughs> no. This is something uh, evil. This is like, the, the, the abyss is like the, the headquarters of evil. And I say that because it's mentioned again in the book more than once. In Revelation eleven seven, 7, for example, says that the beast will come up out of the abyss. The beast being the Roman Empire, who were persecuting the people of God. Revelation chapter 20 says that the dragon, who is, who is the dragon again? Satan will be imprisoned in the abyss. So this is sort of the, you might call it the headquarters of evil. And when the abyss is opened up, we have darkness. And we have these locusts. Well, what does this all mean? Let, let's hold off on that for a minute. But remember, it's picture language. We've got to see the picture first, and then we'll discuss what it means. Look at verse 4. They were told not to hurt the grass of the earth, nor any green thing, nor any tree, but only the men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So these are not normal locusts, are they? They're not hurting any of the vegetation. But what are they uh, interested in? The unfaithful, those without the seal. They were uh, allowed to hurt those who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. Uh, verse 5 says, And they were not permitted to kill anyone, but to torment for five months. And their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it stings a man. Any of you ever been stung by a scorpion? Uh, your babysitter was. I hear it, it's absolutely excruciating. Yeah, not good. So these, these locusts are not permitted to kill anyone, but they're permitted to torment. For five months, he says. Again, symbolic. The numbers are symbolic. It's, it's a short, definite period of time that this is going to happen. Are these, are these actual locusts that sting like scorpions? Is this literal? No. No, it's, it's painting a spiritual picture for us. Let's, let's read on. Verse 6. And in those days men will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, and death flees from them. The appearance of the locust was like horses prepared for battle, and on their heads appeared to be crowns like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like hair of women, and their teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots, of many horses rushing to battle. They have tails like scorpions and stings in their tails. 
Uh, and in their tails is their power to hurt men uh, for five months. Literal locusts? No, can't be. They're like horses, they're like scorpions. But it, what, what image are you getting? What are you feeling as you read this? Torture, yeah, terror. This is horrible. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this, this torture. And then on top of everything else that had been going on that we've already read through, people are saying, I, I just want to die, but God won't allow it. He, death flees from them. Why, why would God do that? You know, we're going to get an answer to that question. Hold on to that thought. Why would God unleash all of this onto these unbelievers? We're going to see the answer to that at the end of chapter 9. They're like war horses. They're terrifying. They have teeth like lions. They sound like chariots and horses running to battle. But now this will tell us a lot in verse 11 and 12. They have as a king over them the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon, and in the Greek he has the name Apollyon. Who is the leader of these locusts? Yeah, the names there in Hebrew and Greek. Abaddon means destruction, and Apollyon means destroyer. And so these are forces of darkness unleashed by this angel of, of the abyss. Notice though that we, we've seen little clues along the way too that like look up in verse 1 again. It says the key of the abyss, the bottomless pit, was given to him. Well, who has the power to do that? This is coming from God, isn't it? And we're going to see that kind of concept again. But God is in, he's in complete control of all of this. And we have to remember that. They needed to know that. God is in complete control, but God can use forces of wickedness to punish wicked people. And I think maybe that's the takeaway here. You know, I can't, I can't say, well, I know exactly what this is and point to some specific thing in history. But I think maybe we're supposed to take away the broad image of this. And what you have here is we have the headquarters of evil unleashing evil on evil people. We have evil people suffering the consequences of their evil deeds. And does that still happen today? Yeah. It may not always look that way, right? Even to David, and, and as he writes in the Psalms, you know, why do he basically asks, why do good people, or bad people rather, why do bad people prosper? But in the end, they don't prosper, do they? And God is dealing with their wickedness. They're suffering the consequences of their wickedness. And Rome and its citizens were, by and large, very wicked, weren't they? Uh, the, the rulers were wicked. The people were wicked and immoral and violent. And you've heard the stories about the things they did to Christians. But God is beginning to act. He's beginning to answer this question, How long, O oh Lord? How long will you wait? Questions or, or thoughts on the fifth trumpet? All right, let's go on to verse 13. What about the sixth trumpet? Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. 
Have we seen this golden altar before in Revelation? It was back in chapter 8, verse 3. This is the altar from which the prayers of the saints are going up. And so in what follows, God is answering their prayers. Um, he's answer, answering this plea from the martyred ones. And look at verse 14. Uh, let me read the whole thing. 13. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. One saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, Release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of all mankind. What's significant do you think about the river Euphrates? If you, and I meant to put a map up, but if you look at, I meant to put a lot of things up, actually. Okay, yeah, it is. It's mentioned right in the beginning in Genesis. What's the significance with the uh, Roman Empire? It was basically the easternmost edge of the empire. So just bear that in mind as we read along. Um, it's the easternmost edge of the empire. And these four angels who are bound at the river, they're going to release something. Look at verse 15. <laughs> and the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year were released so that they would kill a third of mankind. What does that tell you in verse 15? The hour, the, uh, the, the day and the month and year. What does that indicate to us? Yeah, God knows what he's doing. He's got it all planned out. It was planned down to the very moment. And these angels are released and they could kill a third of, they would kill a third of mankind. Verse 16, the number of the armies of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. So these armies are being unleashed. You ever heard of an army with 200 million people? No. Figurative, uh, hyperbolic language to, to paint the picture for us. Uh, what does this all mean? This is all symbols. What does it mean? We'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Verse 17. And this is how I saw in the vision the horses and those who sat on them. The riders had breastplates the color of fire and of hyacinth and of brimstone. And the heads of the horses are like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths proceed fire and smoke and brimstone. A third of mankind was killed by these three plagues. By the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which proceeded out of their mouths. For the power of the horses is in their mouths and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents and have heads, and with them they do harm. Can you imagine a horse like that? It's got a tail like a serpent with a head on it. And it's, you know, they're charging in, and as they go by, they can do damage, you know, with this tail. It's not literal, but, but God is painting a picture for us here of this terror, of this army, the killing power, uh, the judgment that is coming. Well, um, what, is, what does all this mean? What, what's the message that we're supposed to get from this? Rome was constantly plagued by other tribes from outside of their borders. If you've studied history uh, some, you'll know a little bit about all of the issues that Rome had with the, uh, the barbarians, the, the Goths, the, the Huns, all of these people, the Vandals. They all made incursions into Rome and weakened the empire. But 
maybe this is what this is indicating, because they're coming over the river Euphrates. They're coming from outside of the border of Rome. They're coming in to wreak all of this havoc within the empire. And so God is using forces beyond the borders of Rome to add to the judgments on evil people, those without the mark of God. And we asked the question earlier, why is God doing this? It's at His control. It, he's the one making it happen. Would God do things like this? Why would God do things like this? That's right. He wants them to repent. Get their attention. Look at verse 20. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands so as not to worship demons and the idols of gold and silver and brass and of stone and of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. God is trying to get their attention. He's trying to get them to turn around. That's right. They still refuse to repent. That's a lot of evil, isn't it? In the, in the face of all of this, nobody wants to turn to God. They don't want to get their lives right. They don't want to repent. They're just going to continue on in their evil. I thought it was interesting that he said that uh, they did not repent so as to not worship demons. They were worshiping demons. And... Uh, this probably has to do with the idolatry, that they were worshiping these false gods. But who was behind those false gods? It's really demons. Uh, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 20. He says, What do I mean then, that a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to become sharers in demons. So it's an interesting lesson for us. Things like idols, things like the occult, things of that nature. It's, it's demonic. Sherry. I have no doubt. There's definitely demonic influence. That are that's behind this idol worship, and uh, again, God is. Isn't this really an expression of the love of God, trying to get people to repent before it's too late? And it's it's very harsh, but. Yeah. Yes. That's a great warning for us that a heart can become so hardened that even even plagues of this nature won't turn someone around. And it's gradual and it it's hard to wake people up. So the point is let's not find ourselves in that situation. Let's always be tender hearted and listening to the word of God. 
And you get a glimpse here of how God operates. And I believe He still operates this way today. Although we have to be cautious. I don't ever want to say, well, there was some natural disaster or there was some war, and I know for sure that God did this because He's, you know, I don't know that. But I do know that when disasters happen, it would be a good time for all of us to look at ourselves, to look to God, to get right with God, because it very well could be that He's trying to get our attention. Chadwick. Right. Right. Yeah. Just rampant. Idol worship, emperor worship. And then the, you have this other list of things. Um, murders, sorceries, immorality, theft. They're just running, running wild. So let's go into chapter 10. We've got a few minutes left. Chapter 10, verse 1. I saw another strong angel coming down out of heaven, clothed with a cloud, and the rainbow was upon his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. Who, who does this remind you of? Very similar in description to Jesus, right? In chapter, chapter 1. So... This strong angel is a force for good. He's coming from the throne. He's coming from Jesus. And what did he have in his hand in verse 2? A little book. He had in his hand a little book, which was open. He placed his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. Can you imagine how enormous this angel is? One foot on the land, one in the sea, and John is seeing this in this vision. It must have just been breathtaking. Enormous. He's got this book in his hand. What is that about? And then we hear the seven, seven peals of thunder. Verse 4. And it says, I was about to write... And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Seal up the things which the seven peals of thunder have spoken, and do not write them. Well, that's, that makes you curious, doesn't it? I suppose we'll never, never know what this was, but John was not permitted to write it down. So there's no point in speculating. But John is just recording what happened. So he, he tells us what happened. Verse 5. Then the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his right hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things in it and the earth and the things in it and the sea and the things in it, that there will be delay no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. This angel, what does he say? And he swears by it. Verse 6. What's he say? Yes, he's swearing by the one who lives forever and ever, what is, he, what is he attesting to? No more delay. Things are getting really serious, aren't they? Yes, it's coming. It's coming. There will be no more delay. And he says, in the, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel with the seventh trumpet, then the uh, mystery of God is finished as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Yeah. Say that last part again. 
So the good news, okay. So we're going to see uh, in chapter 11 the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And I think this may give us more information on what this mystery is. Think about that. But he's, he's proclaiming good news. And uh, look at verse 8. And I, I, I haven't been keeping up with my own slides, but you're not missing a lot. Let me just put them up. Just a brief outline. So we have the strong angel. Now let's talk about the book. Look at verse 8. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. Would you be a little nervous about that? <laughs> but John goes, verse 9, So I went to the angel telling him to give me the little book. And he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. That sounds odd to us, doesn't it? Take it and eat it. But this is Old Testament language, once again. And being familiar with the Old Testament really helps us here. What does he mean, take it and eat it? Well, if you look in Ezekiel chapter 2 and in chapter 3, we have something very similar. And... Uh, let me just read a portion of that. Ezekiel 2, starting in verse 8. This is a prophecy against the sons of Israel. And God says to Ezekiel, Now you, son of man, listen to what I am speaking to you. Do not be rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I am giving you. Then I looked, and behold, a hand was extended to me, and lo, a scroll was in it. And he spread it out before me. It was written on the front and on the back. Written on it were lamentations, mourning, and woe. Sounds very similar to Revelation, doesn't it? A scroll written on the front and the back, and Ezekiel is commanded to eat it. Bob gave a lesson on this not long ago, just a few weeks ago. Ezekiel 3, in verse 1, he says, Eat what you find. Eat this scroll. And so Ezekiel opens his mouth and eats it. And John does the same here in Revelation. And uh, what did he find when he ate it, according to verse 10? Yeah, sweet in his mouth. Yes, this is... Yes, sweet and bitter at the same time. Sweet in the mouth, bitter in the stomach. Why might it be? Uh, why might it be sweet? And Don said it. This is the word of God. Why would it be sweet? Yeah, yeah. John's a believer. It's the word of God. It's sweeter than honey. You know, it's it's sweet. Why might it be bitter though, in the stomach? The suffering, yeah. Persecution to come, the judgment to come. It's, it's a message of lamentation and woe for the people of the earth who are not willing to repent. It's a lot of heavy things that he's going to have to prophesy. And that's what he's told to do. This is his commission. Oops. John's commission in verse 11. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. And so we're going to see sort of act two. We're about to finish with the scroll, with the seven seals. We're about to sound the seventh trumpet, which was part of the seventh seal. We'll see that in chapter 11 next week. And then... A lot of people see that this little book that he was given is sort of the rest of the story. It's kind of act two of what is to come to the earth. And so we'll get into that uh, next week. And I don't know if we'll get into chapter 12 or not, 
But chapter 12 really begins to unlock a lot of the book as a whole, as does 13. So um, looking forward to that. Appreciate you all. Let's have a prayer together and then we'll be dismissed. Bob, do you have a thought? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Should be joyful to us, sweet sweet in our mouth. That's right. And what do you think he means by eat it? Eat the book. It's like, make it part of you. Take it in. Say again. Digest it. Take it into your being. Make it a part of you. And, and he's going to prophesy. Some, right, with every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, right? All right, well, let's pray together.